Well, if you want to have your Bibles open to 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, I'm going to make reference to it in a little bit. 1 Samuel 13, 14. We've been on, a, been on a great adventure, at least I have been with you in terms of sharing God's Word, but it's now time to change gears again and... Um, while I've been a little bit in your face over the last few weeks about stepping up and being a witness for Christ, being willing and prepared to share the gospel, um, I thought I would step back this morning and in the words of the prophet Isaiah who said, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, bring a comforting message to you this morning, hopefully one that touches your hearts. Perhaps you'll recognize this little song. It goes like this. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk to you again Because a vision softly creeping Left its seat while I was sleeping And the vision that was planted in my brain Still remains within the sounds of silence Now I'm no Simon and Garfunkel Hmm. I'm not Simon or Garfield. <laughs> but I am a Christian who has sometimes wondered about things in silence. Sometimes we worry about the answers to certain questions. Let me lay just a sampling of those questions on your lap. God forbid, but should an infant or a child die, Will their soul go to be with the Lord, baptized or not? Do babies who have been short-circuited to eternity <coughs> through abortion, do they go to heaven? After all, they were given no opportunity to receive God's forgiving love. Will God forgive persons who have had an abortion? Have I committed the unforgivable sin? <clears throat> Does someone who has taken their own life, suicide, do they commit the unforgivable sin? Will God forgive divorce, remarriage? Who will God accept? Who will God not accept? These are among some of the questions that we we concern ourselves and we worry about in silence. They're nagging questions that fill our hearts with anxiety. And they are important questions because they deal with matters of eternal significance. They're very important. And so we look into Scripture. That's, after all, where we find our answers, right? What does God say to this issue, to this subject? Does God answer these questions? And what we discover is that not every question that we have or that we present to God is directly answered in Scripture. It's simply not. And so we worry about the answers in silence. But that doesn't mean there isn't an answer. Of course there is. When the Scriptures do not include a direct answer to the question that we have, especially among these that are so significant, I'll tell you what I do. And it's given me great peace. As I look into the heart of God. I look into the heart of God. Of course, when I use the expression heart, I'm not talking about the organ that pumps blood. God is spirit. He has no physical heart such as we have. It's a term we use when we're talking about a person's innermost being, right? Who the person is at their core. Who is God at his core? What is the characteristic that, that makes up God, who he is? And so when I say that we should look into the heart of God, I mean that God wants us to discern the kind of nature, God, that he is. What is God like? How does God relate to humans? How has he revealed himself to us? It says in... Uh, 1 Samuel 13, 14, some of you have your Bibles open there. It's speaking of David that he was a man who sought, sought after God's heart. Here's a man who wanted to know who God was at the very depth of God's being. Who God was at his core, the deepest level. 
Now you know as well as I do that God often gets blamed for many injustices in this world. He's indifferent. He's arbitrary. He's unjust. He's unfair. I remember in the wake of a terrible accident, the sister-in-law of a lady that was killed threw me, physically threw me up against the wall and said, where is God? Her accusation was God was absent. Perhaps some people would accuse God of being vague about who can go to heaven and who can't. But there have been times I've also been accused of different things, and so have you. Things that you may or may not have done. Sometimes I've been accused of my intentions being not all that they should be, and I find myself saying to the person who's accusing me, why would you accuse me of such things if you only knew my heart, you would know that I would never intentionally do something or do that to hurt you. Maybe I've done something inadvertently to hurt you, but it would never be with, with purpose or intention in my heart to cause you pain. If you could only look into my heart, you would know. And my proposition is this, why don't we extend to God that same courtesy? Let's look into the heart of God. To answer the question concerning the destiny of an infant or someone who's taken their own life, let's look into the heart of God. What is God like? And maybe we'll find some insurance, assurance as to the way God would respond to those incidents. The Bible says that God tries the reins of our hearts. In other words, He knows our desires, He knows our intents, He knows everything about it, He knows our motives. We can measure the intents of God's heart. And it's not that hard to do. Go to the next slide here. This is how easy it is to know the heart of God. We only have to look as far as Jesus himself, who said in the scriptures in John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to know what the heart of God is like, you only have to reflect on Jesus and the way he revealed himself to us. Because he demonstrated his passion. He demonstrated his nature. He showed us his heart. And so let's look into God's heart this morning. You know, many years ago I was repairing a, an outdoor light. It was one of those coach lantern lights. And I was washing it in a bucket of water. And as I was washing it, suddenly I noticed that the water was turning red. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I, I lifted it up and, and then I looked at my hand and of course there was a big slice right across my hand. And so a piece of broken glass from the the coach light had, had cut my hand with one of the, the edges. Well, this common experience serves to illustrate something for us this morning. We have all had life experiences that have broken us. We are a broken people. It's, it's, it's life experience. Perhaps it was an emotional injury associated with being called names when you were younger, or perhaps you failed at, or were failing at school or sport, or even in a job. Perhaps someone or something you cherished was was taken away from you, maybe your parents separated, or someone broke up with you, or your marriage is, is on the rocks, or worse, you have all suffered emotional pain. We are a broken people. This is the nature of living. And like glass, human brokenness can create edges. Those of you who have been broken know about this. We often develop sharp edges because of our brokenness. And we develop sharp edges to protect ourselves from being broken again. Sometimes we want to get near or get to know somebody who's been broken in their past, but they put up these defense mechanisms, in a sense edges, and if you get too close to them, you're going to get cut. Because of emotional brokenness, there are millions of two-legged shards moving all around this planet. And so brokenness is a word that, that articulates, it's a term that, that refers to the emotional, physical, psychological brokenness that we experience in this life. And I say all that because if we look into the heart of God as evidence in Jesus, what will you find there? You will find brokenness in Jesus himself. Jesus was rejected by his hometown people, Nazareth. They chased him out of town. 
In fact, they tried to harm him. His own family at one point in Jesus' ministry testified that they thought he was out of his mind. Scriptures say that he was out of his mind. That's the way his family perceived him. Have you ever had your family hmm. articulate something that was hurtful to you? His closest friends, the disciples, at the moment when he was arrested, they forsook him and fled. Have you ever felt alone? Jesus felt utter aloneness. And Judas, one of the closest, one of the twelve, betrayed him. Have you ever been betrayed by a friend or a family member, a spouse? And yet more than just relational, Jesus experienced brokenness in terms of his physical body being crushed on the cross. We know that. And so a look into God's heart discovers brokenness there. God is acquainted with the things that we feel. He too has a broken heart. And this is the first thing we need to know about God's heart. If we're to settle those nagging questions that scream at us in the silence of our own hearts and minds, we need to remember that God has a broken heart. That's number one. When you look into the heart of God, God has a broken heart. But unlike people who develop edges because they've been hurt, God does not. This is where Jesus and the rest of us are different. It says of Jesus in the book of Hebrews that he is not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. And it goes on to say that because of that, we can boldly approach his throne so that we can receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And so instead of Jesus transposing his brokenness into something that is, is cutting, something that will hurt those around him, Jesus transposes, he takes his pain and transposes it into expressions of mercy and grace. Mercy means that God does not give us, Jesus does not give us what we do deserve in terms of punishment. And grace means that he does give us what we don't deserve in terms of kindness and love. God is a God of mercy and grace. So we take a few snapshots of Jesus from the Gospels and we'll see that there's a woman caught in the act of adultery. She's been accused by a religious group and she's thrown at the feet of Jesus and they're expecting Jesus to condemn her as well. But Jesus, you know the story, he tells his accusers he is without sin, cast the first stone. And they back away because they all know that they've, they've done wrong. And then he looks at her and he says, where are your accusers? And she goes, there are none. And he goes, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. That's the heart of God. It's not a heart that is anxious to condemn people. It's a heart that is anxious to receive, accept, and forgive. But go and sin no more. The prodigal son, the story which Jesus told, tells of a boy who, who's rebellious to his father, goes and takes his inheritance and goes out and squanders it in wild living. And when he comes back, his father doesn't reject him, but he's so enthralled with the fact that his boy has come back to him, has returned to him, that he slaughters the fatted calf and he throws a party, a celebration. There's no lectures, there's no sermons, there's no I told you so's. There's just, son, I'm so glad that you're with me again. That's the heart of God on display. The children were on Jesus' lap. The disciples said, we don't have time for them. And Jesus says, hold it. Let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of God. That's the heart of God on display. And so perhaps in your own silence, you've wrestled with whether God could ever forgive you. You've repented, you've said sorry for your sins, but still you struggle. God could never forgive me. <laughs> what I've done is outside the lines. Well, it tells us in Scripture that the heart of God is filled with mercy and grace. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And when we confess, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it says in the Psalms that He divides our sin as far as the east from the west and He recalls it no more. You can be assured that God has forgiven you. If you go to a beach and you dig a whole series of holes, and they're different depths. 
representing the different kinds of sins that we have done in our own life. You will notice that when the tide comes in, it fills them all equally. That's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. You don't need to walk around and live with uncertainty. There's assurance. And to find that assurance, simply look into the heart of God. A priest in the Philippines, he carried a burden in, 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 in the secrecy of his own heart and soul for many years. He had repented, but he still had no peace. And then he met a woman who said that she had visions and she talked with Christ all the time. And so this priest thought he would test the, the legitimacy of this woman and, and her ability to commune with Christ. And he said to her, when you inquire of the Lord, I want you to ask the Lord what sin I committed when I was in seminary. <coughs> and she said, okay, I will. And so he met her a few days later and he said, well, did Christ speak to you in your dreams? And she said, yes, he did. And he asked, did you ask him what sin I had committed when I was in seminary? And she said, I did. Well, what did he say? Well, the Lord told me that he doesn't remember because what he forgives, he forgets. <laughs> it's the heart of God. And so the way Jesus dealt with sinners demonstrates the heart of God. It's a broken heart without edges and it's a broken heart that's filled with mercy and it's filled with grace. Ask the adulterers. Ask the prodigal. Ask the children. They know. So let me leave you with this. Another look into the Gospels also shows that Jesus was never, ever too busy or reluctant to express His mercy and His grace. When He was tired and the crowds followed and the disciples said, the Lord is too tired, He needs rest, and He says, send them away, this is what the disciples said, Jesus said no. Even in weariness, physical weariness, He fed them and He healed them. He always had time. Well, it was the Sabbath, and the ruler said, you can't heal a person on the Sabbath. Don't you know it's a religious rule? <clears throat> and Jesus said, the religious rules. <laughs> That's literally what he said. It's in the Greek. The religious rules. And he healed the man on the Sabbath. Because Jesus was always, this, remember this, if you're going to write anything down, Ollie, write this down. <laughs> Jesus was always more interested in mercy and grace than he was in appearing to be righteous. He was always more interested in showing compassion and mercy to people than he was in appearing to be religious. The heart of God was displayed through Jesus. Condemnation was replaced with mercy. Confessed sin was met with the grace of forgiveness. Bondage was met with the grace of freedom. And wounds were met with the grace of healing. So when you look into the heart of Jesus, you'll find brokenness but it's a brokenness without edges. It's a brokenness that's been rounded off to express mercy and grace to you, regardless of what situation you're in. And so those heavy questions that weigh on our spirits, should an infant or child to die, die, will their soul go to heaven, having been baptized or not being baptized? Do babies who have been short-circuited to eternity through abortion go to heaven? Have I committed the unforgivable sin? To someone who's taken their own life, is their destiny safe with the Lord? Will God forgive divorce and accept remarriage? Who does God accept? Who does God not accept? Don't be troubled by those things. Look into the core of God's being as reflected through the life of Jesus. Look into the heart. Exodus 34, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Our God is a loving God. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. That draws me to the Lord. Thank God for his heart.